Hello, are we live? We sure are. Awesome. Um, hello, welcome everyone. I think we've got about 109 participants already in, um, but welcome to Pine Gap um, to Gaza panel. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the continuing sovereignty of all First Nations people all across the country. I'd like to acknowledge my elders and ancestors and the elders and ancestors of all people here today. And I also want to acknowledge the Palestinian people, our Palestinian brothers and sisters, Nasser on the panel, but also those who may be watching currently. Um, we're going to start with an acknowledgement to country uh, by Aranta Elder Ani Felicity Hayes. So I'm just going to share that. People <laughs> Margaret and Pomelaman, non in character. Let and a people and boys at home, Baba Map, a rather to a Mara Conner Mitnagan, it natural or lie a Pajama, Australiana. And only can support a military in Gerard, Australian area, in Gerard, the Lanon. It's like to say, welcome to around the country of Springs. Uh, and we like to express our. Um, Sincere um, condolence to the uh, people that are being uh, bomb bombed in 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 Gaza. For the old people, the children, the men and women who died because of what's happening with with the war at Gaza and from like Central Australia and around the country, we are so sorry that this is happening. We sincerely like to say that we are sorry, and it should have been happening. We support people of Palestine. Correct. Um, that was Aranta Elder Ani Felicity Hayes giving an acknowledgement to country in language. And I think just to sit with her words, the words that our ancestors heard, the words that um, on this country they tried to destroy. And following on from Ani Felicity, I just wanted to say I'd also like to remember the 30,000 Palestinian men, women and children who have been killed by the Israeli genocidal regime. I want to remember those who are still surviving, those who are mourning, those who are still resisting, those who have been disappeared into Israeli prisons and detention centers, those who are still under the rubble, those are who, who are currently being systematically starved by Israel. I want to remember them and pay our respects and our love and care for them as Aboriginal people. Um, and I should also say I'm a Durumbal and South Sea Islander woman and journalist. Um, and we feel a real feeling of solidarity with the Palestinian people. I want to pay my respect to those across occupied Palestine and in the Palestinian diaspora. And I want to acknowledge but the pain and grief that we are witnessing in this genocide is so small in magnitude to the enormous pain and grief felt by our Palestinian brothers and sisters who also witness it on these same stolen lands that we're speaking from today. A pain that is not just in the spirit and in the soul, but also in the bones. And the reason we identify it as that, as Aboriginal people, and as Ani Barb is going to talk to about um, briefly, uh, shortly, is because this is also a land um, a settler colony that has perpetrated genocide and a continuing genocide against us. 
And that's why we're coming here today. We're talking about genocide and fundamentally we're talking about complicity. And that's why we're revolving this conversation around Pine Gap. Um, at one point called, uh, described as the United States second most important surveillance base globally. And yet it is something you will not hear about in the mainstream media, particularly the role of Australia. And as we continue to question the Australian state's complicity in what we know to be a genocide, and they don't want, to, want us to talk about genocide, even after the ICJ found a plausible case of genocide, even after just yesterday, the UN Special Rapporteur for the Rights on the, on the, of the Occupied Palestinian Territories said that she found clear evidence of genocide and Israel is perpetrating a genocide. We don't even need all of this evidence. We don't even need this international, this opinion in international law because we see it for ourselves. And I think it's um, thank you as well to the organizers of this really important panel today. We have three Aboriginal women speaking. We have our Palestinian brother, Nasser Mashni speaking. Um, and just a quick um, explanation of how it's going to run. We're going to hear from um, Ani Barbara Flick first, and then we're going to go into a presentation by Professor Richard um, Tanter, who's delivering a paper specifically about Pine Gap and Australia's role in complicity and genocide. I just wanted to briefly run through the biographies of our very esteemed panel. Uh, Professor Richard Tanter is a senior research associate at the Nautilus Institute, honorary professor in the School of Political and Social Scientists at the U Sciences at the University of Melbourne. He's a former president of the Australian Board of the International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in October 2017. Um, Nasser Mashni um, is president of the Australia Palestine Advocacy Network. He's the son of a Palestinian refugee, co founder for Australians for Palestine, and is a founding board member of Olive Kids. With his father's legacy in mind, Nasser is determined to continue the struggle for justice in a free Palestine. And he's been there on the streets every single weekend, out in the media, showing exactly what the Australian media is doing in relation to Palestine. Uh, Barbara Flick is a Uruguay Gumularoy woman. Barb has many years experience working across a wide range of issues, including health service delivery, land rights, community development, welfare reform, adult education, Aboriginal language maintenance and preservation, homeland resettlement, health, criminology, social justice and human rights. And when she lived in Alice Springs, she was on the board of the Central Australian Aboriginal Congress and she was actually arrested at the Pine Gap protests of 1988 and her family has strong connections to Palestine. Um, we also have Associate Professor Catherine Gilby is an Eloha scholar and long-term academic activist. She specializes in First Nations knowledges, inclusive education and critical race theories. Um, and finally, Peter Cronau is an award-winning investigative journalist, one of the few Australian journalists speaking truth to power. Um, he worked on ABC TV's Four Corners and Radio National's background briefing, where he did a really ex extensive investigation into Pine Gap. And he's currently the editor and co-founder of Declassified Australia. Um, and in November last year, a month into the genocide in Gaza, he actually wrote a piece for Declassified Australia called Targeting Palestine, Australia's secret support for the Israeli assault on Gaza through Pine Gap. Um, and so with that long intro in mind, um, and before we go to um, Professor Tanter's presentation, and the presentation will take about 20 minutes. Then we're gonna have a discussion and we'll take questions. So you can pop your questions in the Q&A and we'll have time for our panel to answer it. Um, but before we go into the presentation, I think it's really important, particularly on this land, to prioritize and center the voices of Aboriginal women. Um, and Barbara, I wanted to open up the conversation with you. Um, talking about your reflections and seeing what's currently happening in Gaza, what is happening in Pine Gap, how it relates to um, what happened here on our own stolen lands. Thank you, Amy. I should say my Yuba, my language means thank you. Um, water, I think thank you um, from the Avenda people um, for their condolences and thoughts um, for the people especially the women and children and everybody. It's the most disgusting situation. Um, and we can all see it happening around the world. Indigenous people have always fought for this land, this land, our sovereignty, 
we have never ceded our sovereignty. We've been colonised and um, <laughs> we're still being colonised today. Uh, I just, uh, I think that we come from a really caring place in our hearts, especially with, with women. You know, we carry the babies in our bodies and uh, that's where love develops for all humanity, human beings. And my experience with the Aranda people um, around Mbantwa in the 1980s um, was very close. My, my great friendship with um, MK Turner, you know, the most knowledgeable um, person I've ever met in my life, and her part in the Pine Gap um, campaigns, 1988. Uh, genocide was committed here in, in Australia, <clears throat> but we didn't have television. But when I think about it, 400 people killed outside Brewarana, my mob. I can just, you know, it was daybreak and people were waking up and these pastoralists rode in on big horses with guns and swords and started slashing into people. 400 killed that day. And I, I can hear, I can hear the cries and the screams and the, and the absolute hopelessness. People had nothing, nothing to combat that destruction. But um, in 88, I was arrested in, in the campaign and um, in court, I pleaded not guilty to trespass on Commonwealth lands. I said um, I was on Arunda country and I had the permission of Arunda people to be there. Anyway, they gave me a community service order and um, sent me out to serve scones on, on the Garden Railway. But, but my father was very close. My father, Joe Flick, to the Palestinian people. And I did send in a photograph taken in 92 of Dad meeting a diplomat and, um, and uh, showing his solidarity by handing over an Aboriginal flag. So our family have always been close. And we must always remember in our hearts what's happening today, that part of colonisation that's ongoing. Thank you so much, um, Ani Bab, for situating exactly what is happening and showing the links through your very personal lived experience um, mm -hmm. of settler colonial violence from here to Gaza. And I think um, what has often, I've often heard it said as an excuse that we shouldn't care about issues over there is that there's a tyranny of distance. And yet I don't see any distance at all, particularly with our Palestinian brothers and oh. sisters here. And I particularly don't see a distance in relation to what we're going to talk about today, which is Pine Gap, um, for which Dr. Tr uh, Professor Trant Tanta is going to deliver his presentation now relating to the role of Pine Gap and the questions it raises around the complicity um, of Australia in the genocide that is currently perpetrated in Gaza. Um, so the presentation goes for about 20 minutes and afterwards I'm gonna open up the panel um, to start discussing it. And then as well, if you wanna put in your questions in the Q&A, please do so and we'll get to them as well as we continue um, the webinar. Did you wanna take over? Amy, thanks very much for that. And I'd just like to second a great deal of what you said. I'm speaking from Mary Beck from NAM. And I spend my and I pay my respects to the elders of Wurundjeri country, but also to people who are li listening, Indigenous and Palestinian. And my thanks and respects to Artie Barb and Artie Flick for that welcome and that information. It's extraordinarily hard to talk about something like Pine Gap. In a way, it's one of the centres of this country. If one might be Uluru, if another for people who see hope in the United States as our future, Pine Gap is that awful bloody centre. One of the things I'm going to be talking about is the extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary thing that the South African government has done for us. South Africa, a big country, but not a very powerful, a strong one, has taken on a small country, but a very powerful one in Israel and making it clear that they absolutely make the point about apartheid and colonialism in, in Israel as part of everything that they understand. And they've been speaking about it for a very long time. I'm going to be referring to a, um, a complaint in the legal language that I've made to the 
a person called the Inspector General of Security and Intelligence, which is one of the small uh, links of actual democratic accountability in the bureaucracy, uh, about Pine Gap and in particular what happens uh, in Pine Gap in relation to Gaza. I'll be speaking that, about that for a few moments. Going on, firstly, I'll start talking about the International Court itself and, it's, and it, what it's done. It met in The Hague and on the 26th of January, it issued an order, which was a kind of temporary order aimed at Israel, saying that at least some of the rights claimed by South Africa for which it was seeking protection, protection for the Palestinian people, are plausible. And that there is urgency in the sense that there is a real and imminent risk of irreparable prejudice. I think that's clear to anyone who watches the mass media. Israel must take all measures in its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention, which I think other people are very familiar with. It begins with killing members of the group and it proceeds. Take all measures within its power to prevent and punish the direct and incorrect and public incitement to genocide. Take immediate and effective measures to enable provision of urgently needed basic services. And also, perhaps a small sidelight, but I think quite important, take effective measures to prevent the destruction and ensure the preservation of evidence. Now, Israel is doing precious little of that, um, but that, that case will work itself out over the next year. And at least for the first time, the world's highest court in international law has spoken very loudly, very directly, about the gravest crime in international law, namely genocide. So what must Australia do? Well, I want to draw attention to the responsibilities of the Attorney General, the highest legal officer in the Commonwealth, and the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, who I've mentioned. As a party to the UN Convention on, on what is called the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, Australia has an obligation under international law to punish and prevent plausible or demonstrated cases of genocide. Prevention clearly requires consideration of something which is imminent, which is going to happen, which is already happening, a possibility rendered plausible, in fact, by the provision to Israel through Australia of military intelligence, through Australia's apparently unrestricted and institutional technological integration into what are properly called United States auspiced or supposed global signals intelligence network. Faced with these responsibilities, the Attorney General has a responsibility, I think, I believe, and I think go further, I would insist, to investigate Australia's standing into possible Australian complicity in the acts of plausible genocide listed in the ICJ's order. To be clear, the order itself speaks to Israel and to South Africa. But as a party to the convention, Australia has certain responsibilities. The other matter I want to talk about appears very arcane, but I think it's fairly important. We have an Inspector General of Intelligence and Security after many, many scandals in the intelligence organisation, who is charged with reviewing the activities in particular, in this case, of what is called the Australian Signals Directorate, which is the Australian part of Pine Gap, concerning Pine Gap, to ensure, quote, the agencies act legally and with propriety, comply with ministerial guidelines and directives and respect human rights. Apologies, Richard. Um, sorry, can I just get you to press use slideshow? Just some of the um, viewers are having trouble reading the slides. If you go up to the up to use slideshow. Okay. On to the left. The left. Yeah. Oh, uh, use slideshow. Yeah, I think that should work. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Apologies, folks. Please interrupt at any time for uh, disasters like that. Propriety is a funny word, but it basically, whatever it, whatever it's used for, it means that one should act or the body concerned should act in conformity with uh, community expected standards of morality and legality for that matter. So it's pretty clear what that means in this case. I want to talk about as quickly as I can, but without gabbling, five elements which I think Pine Gap is involved in, in, involved in, which contribute to the risk of Australian complicity in those acts of genocide, plausible and urgent uh, matters raised in the ICJ order. 
Firstly, I want to talk about the technical capabilities and the roles of the satellites, in particular, what are called geosynchronous, means they sit above the sky of the Earth at one particular point, intelligence satellites, um, um, and, um, sorry, I can't quite see the, the whole screen now, um, through coverage of Pine Gap. So the second thing I want to talk about is what we know about the historical record. We know, in fact, we know, in fact, that um, Australia has in the past, through or rather the United States on our behalf, without asking Australia, did provide intelligence information from Pine Gap during the 1973 war between Israel and Egypt and Syria. I want to talk about the flows of intelligence from Pine Gap to the United States Security Agency, which of course dominates what happens at Pine Gap in the, in the areas we're talking about. And I also then want to talk about the Signals Intelligence Cooperation Agreements, very dense network of cooperation agreements between the NSA, the National Security Agency, and its Israeli counterpart. In other words, I'm talking about a flow of data from Pine Gap to the American NSA, from the NSA to Israel. And this is, I think, not a matter of any doubt. And then I want to finish by pointing to the absence of restrictions. As far as we know, the not be place, the absence of restrictions on the activities of Pine Gap or on the activities of American intelligence networks. So quickly, the satellites, just looking at this for the moment. Amy, can you give me a five minute warning? There are four um, uh, what are called advanced Orion satellites. They're about six tons each, a small truck. They sit over the equator in, uh, in a row, ranging roughly from where Pine Gap is on that map through to the middle of the Indian Ocean. And those oval shapes tell you the geographic range of the extraordinarily sensitive receiving equipment on these satellites. Satellites 36,000 kilometres in the air with antennas, a whole lot of antennas, but one in particular over 100 metres across, picking up very, very faint signals from the ground. You'll see that the left-hand three, the westernmost three of those satellites, cover Gaza completely. That's an extraordinary level of involvement, and we know it. And for those who are interested, there is some of the technical details. We know, and this is particularly a role that, that Peter Cronow, who's speaking later, played an extraordinarily important role in telling us about, about the main interception roles and, and capabilities. I worked with my colleagues Desmond Ball, who died a few years ago, and Bill Robinson, and Bill and I still work on these issues, and produced, I think it was eight substantial research papers on, this, on these matters. The point of mentioning those is that while Pine Gap is often reported in the media as cloaked in mystery, that we can find out nothing about it, that's absolutely wrong. I think we know more about Pine Gap than we do about any other American intelligence basis on the basis not of rumour, not of what somebody said in a pub, but of very clear documentation. Peter's role uh, several years ago was to produce a ABC a background briefing radio sh show, which used documents from Edward Snowden, which for the first time gave us very precise definitions from the American side. This is an NSA document about rainfall, which is the signals intelligence part of Pine Gap. I won't go through those technical terms on the right-hand side, but you're welcome to pursue it um, separately. These satellites, these giant uh, signals intelligence satellites, four of them uh, controlled by Pine Gap, three covering Gaza, have a whole set of targets. Firstly, what they listen to other satellites nearby, what's coming up to those other satellites, and from telecommunications and satellite phones. They pick up a huge range of microwave transmissions, which sounds rather old fashioned, but think about all the towers for the phone systems that you see around us. They pick up uh, lots of telecommunications towers, not just with through which cell phone um, data and messages are, are, uh, are transmitted, but in many parts of the world through internet connections. They also pick up, and this is obviously of military importance, particularly now in, 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 in the Middle East, as well as in other places, air defense system, radars, 
all sorts of military radio communications. And they also pick up a lot of computers, talking to computers. And when missiles are being tested, they send their data back to um, their host base. And of course, the Americans listen into this. This is an extraordinary range of data. And it's been going on since 1970, getting more and more dense in terms of its capabilities. Who runs Pine Gap? Well, the answer is the American National Reconnaissance Office. The agreement that Australia has with the United States is signed on the one hand by the Australian Signals Directorate, part of uh, the Department of Defence, on the other hand, by the National Reconnaissance Office. There is no doubt whatsoever that the NRO, which basically builds the satellites and the ground stations, is an extraordinarily um, weight, has an extraordinarily weighty say in what goes on. And you can just see, really, from this chart that Des Ball and Bill Robinson and I put together of how intense the bureaucratic dominance is. This is probably at the level of higher management. You go down a bit, you get to Pine Gap, to the chief of facility, and then you find the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. You find the National Security Agency. You find the military cryptological groups. You find the National Geophysical uh, Agency. And you find, finally, the Australian Signals Directorate. And then a brace of Aust US military uh, units and below. I'm going to talk about uh, who runs the Pine Gap through talking about the idea of full knowledge and concurrence, which is a phrase which is used in treaties, it's used in government, it's used to say, or to say to people like all of us, don't you worry, we know what's happening at Pine Gap and it's just fine. It's Australia's declared policy for control of the joint facilities in the context of what is in fact US control. I'll give you an example, the director of the Australian Singles Directorate, Rachel Noble, in February was speaking at Senate Estimates Committee and was asked about that phrase. And she reminded us that the Defence Minister had recently said, full knowledge means Australia has a full and detailed understanding of any capability um, and uh, with a presence on Australian territory uh, or making use of Australian assets. Concurrence goes on, uh, she and the minister said, means Australia approves of the presence or of a capability or function in Australia in support of mutually agreed goals. Extraordinarily vain, like vague language. What does it actually mean in reality? Well, at Pine Gap, compared with the old days in Pine Gap, there's an improvement. Half the personnel are Australians. The deputy chief is an Australian. There are Australian managers at the middle levels. Australians have access to all parts of Pine Gap except what's called the US National Cryptographic Room, where they code their stuff to go back to Washington. They can't get access to ours. Australia all gets, also gets access to all raw data and processed intelligence for however much good you think it does us. It's much more joint than in the early years. But what does it really mean? Well, first of all, two unofficial interpretations are useful. The Australian journalist, Graham Dobell, um, some years ago said, well, what it means is Australia must concur to the function and operation of the facility, but does not have control over individual US taskings. Broad concurrence, yes. Individual veto, no. We'll think about that in relation to Gaza. Another informant who is very familiar with Pine Gap or operations summed it up as saying, well, what, what that means is participation in everything, in all the Pine Gap's operations, but it gives Australia full transparency, but it means we have no control. And fundamentally, this is an issue of sovereignty, which is not being addressed. The historical record, well, we know, thanks to Geoffrey Ch Richardson and Desmond Ball, that in 1973, when the satellites have the coverage, as you can see there on the right-hand side, in fact, uh, very important intelligence was passed on from Pine Gap through the United States directly to Israel. And this gave Israel extraordinarily important information which allowed them to break out of a um, uh, essentially a, um, a barrier from the Egyptian military in Sinai, and it led to the win that Israel had at that time. And that was at a time when, as Paul and Richardson pointed out, the official Australian position uh, in that war was even handed. So much for that. There's a very important black man called um, 
David Rosenberg, who worked at Pine Gap for 18 years as a very senior signals intelligence uh, um, analyst who wrote a very interesting book called Inside Pine Gap after he resigned from Pine Gap. But he has long experience with the NSA over about 23 years from memory. Peter Cronauer, who will speak later, um, uh, interviewed David Rosenberg uh, in early November, where he said the Pine Gap facility is monitoring the Gaza Strip and surrounding areas with all its resources, gathering intelligence to be useful to Israel. Pine Gap has assets overhead. Every one of those assets would be on those locations looking for anything that could help them. Pine Gap is monitoring the Gaza Strip and the surrounding areas with all its resources and gathering intelligence assessed to be useful to Israel. So that equation is really important. Personnel, he said, at Pine Gap are tasked to collect signals such as command and control centers in Gaza with Hamas headquarters, uh, notionally according to um, uh, Rosenberg, located near hospitals, schools and other civilian structures. What's really important about that, which is on the basis of his own experience, and he you have to say he left Pine Gap in two, about 2008, is it fits exactly what conservative media in the United States, such as the Wall Street Journal, are reporting. That when the Israel Defense Force claimed that their intercepts proved, quote unquote, that Hamas was embedded at uh, uh, the Al Shifa Hospital in northern Gaza, the American National Security Agency allowed to be known that on the basis of their own intercepts, they agreed with the Israelis. Now, whether that was either of those claims were right or wrong, what it tells us is the NSA is very clearly involved in this. And there's good reason to think that the Wall Street Journal article is talking about uh, Pine Gap uh, and also other stations we can talk about a bit later on. I'll have to move quickly now for time, and my apologies. I want to talk about this extraordinary web of intelligence agreements between the National Security Agency and the Israel National Security uh, Signals Intelligence Unit. It goes back to 1968, an early agreement. We mentioned the Yom Kippur War. There have been two or three agreements with names like Ice Castle, Stone Ruby, um, along the way, and then a very important one in 1999, which formalised everything much more seriously, and in particular focused on signals intelligence. Just to give you a glimpse of this stuff, in 2006, the NSA had a town meeting, I guess, like what we're having here uh, for them, and it involved 750 NSA people who worked with the Israel Signals Intelligence National Unit. Five minutes, Richard. Sorry, eight minutes, thank you. Ah, five minutes, yeah. <laughs> Who's cutting? Okay, I want to jump to the last one, the uh, information paper. I won't go through all of this, but it is just extraordinary. This was a summary of what was happening uh, in 2013. It's an extraordinarily detailed, it's only a two-page document, but these clips give us a very, very clear understanding of uh, what they're looking for, what they're sharing with Israel, uh, what Israel can look for, and what are what's called low, called lower down the target sets. I'll leave people to have a look at that at another time. The discussion about the alliance or the treaties between China and Russia, as I think President Xi called it, a no limits alliance. I think that's not a bad description of this alliance between Australia and the United States, as well as this alliance between the United States and Israel, however unhappy Biden, President Biden may be at the moment with particular matters. All of this is now coming in very, very concentrated form. Gaza, Middle East is central for the United States. The, the Gaza conflict, as Bob says, and as Amy said, it, this is happening on television. This is clear to everybody. The severity, the violence of it, the genocide of it is clear. The United States wants to both support the Netanyahu government and mildly limit what it, what it wants. But above all, it's worried about the escalation. It may spill over out of Gaza for all sorts of reasons. At the heart of that lies the need for intelligence, timely, reliable, usable intelligence, pretty much on everyone, Gaza included. All American signals intelligence that can possibly be brought to bear will have elevated what are called tasking schedules, 
point the satellites here, listen to this, don't concentrate on that, bring us information on this and this and this. Further, Pine Gap will be on high alert. Uh, sorry, go back. But a very unhappy possibility that occurred to me rereading those NSA documents, it's very likely on the basis of what we know about those agreements that Israel is pressing for its concerns to be added to those US signals intelligence tasking schedules, resulting in tasking demands on Pine Gap through the NSA. There are no restrictions that we know of, either by the Australians or the Americans on these flows of signals intelligence. And indeed, the Australians could close off any concern about ongoing complicity uh, in, uh, in acts of genocide in Gaza by simply saying, we have stopped passing any Pine Gap derived material that may have a bearing on the Gaza Strip to the United States. The United States could also do something comparable to, to um, uh, Israel. But such precautionary temporary steps have not been announced following the ICJ order by either country. And it's reasonable to assume that even if they haven't said anything in public, it's very unlikely they've done anything uh, in, in behind secret, secret walls. So what are the primary questions the Attorney General and the Inspector General of Security have to look at? This is the end part. Does anything the Australian Signals Directorate has done or is doing at Pine Gap that in any way amounts to complicity in the activities of plausible acts of genocide set out by the order from the International Court of Justice and to which Australia has a responsibility as a state's party to the convention. Does, in fact, if we talk about full knowledge and concurrence, does Pine Gap derived intelligence or is Pine Gap derived intelligence forward to the National Security Agency? And does it implicate Australia in, in complicity in Gaza. In such a case, does the government concur full knowledge and concurrence, concur with such a policy? And if the government does concur in such a policy, is not a veto, a veto, at least while until a final judgment by the ICJ is brought down, not the appropriate response, a mere veto, that would be a good thing. And then we have to ask, after all the horrors here, if not for a plausible and urgent claim of genocide, subject to a case before the world's highest court that raises the possibility of Australian complicity, then for what would Australia ever exercise, ever exercise its sovereign right to a veto about what happens on Australian soil? I'll finish there. There is a on the slide set some information of, uh, that will be available uh, after the, uh, somehow in the recording. It'll be done. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Professor Tanter, for that brilliant and forensic um, presentation. I wasn't even really, I apologize if I wasn't watching the time properly because I was so engaged um, in trying to keep up. Um, and I think you, express the questions that have simply not been asked. And I was really struck by when you said about Pine Gap is, there's this perception Pine Gap is um, shrouded in mystery. And yet we have people who know about it, including yourself. And yet we're so many days into a genocide and these questions haven't been asked. Um, I wanted to open the panel up now for our discussion um, and then please keep putting your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them as well. But I really wanted to open up first to NASA, um, maybe about your reflections on the presentation, but also you see as the complicity of Australia at the moment um, in what is currently still ongoing in Gaza. Indeed, and, and thank you so much, Amy, everybody. Uh, Richard, what a, what a fabulous presentation. Um, before I start, I, I, I do dearly want to thank um, Auntie Barb for, for your wonderful uh, introduction uh, to that um, beautiful welcome we had in language uh, to my sister Amy for, for being here and any other Indigenous brothers and sisters, uh, elders, but also any other Indigenous people that may have arrived here as settlers because they were fleeing colonialism themselves. Um, we know and absolutely believe this always was and always will be and forever will be Aboriginal land that we've never ceded sovereignty 
that um, the fight for Indigenous rights here is the fight for Indigenous rights in Palestine. And with the video we saw of the Indonesians doing just across the, the sea, what um, the Indonesians are doing to the West Papuans, that our fight against anti um, against settler colonialism is a fight for all people of all uh, for self determination in their lands, wherever that might be. And um, it's in that context um, that I, I, I want to speak to you about Gaza, because what we're seeing in Gaza is, in fact, um, settler colonialism manifest. What you are seeing is a live um, genocide. What you are seeing is what this country experienced 236, 237 years ago, which is a superior, quote unquote, um, culture, race, ideology that um, uh, wants land, wants resources, and doesn't want Indigenous people. As this land was once 100% Indigenous, Palestine was 100% Indigenous. To Palestine, us Palestinians were Muslim, Christian, Jew, and every other religion that um, uh, owes its um, indigeneity to that land, that noble land of um, the Abrahamic faiths and, and their offshoots. That when that civ um, more civilised uh, culture came, it came with a language that we didn't know, a language that taught us words like aged care, taught us words like um, prison, taught us words like police, taught us words like homelessness, taught us words like hunger, because we didn't have that. We didn't have those words. What they brought with them, though, with their superiority was weaponry. And the language of settler colonialism in viol is violence, and we see that now in Gaza, but we also see that today in the Northern Territory in, in, with the curfew that's just been announced. The language of settler colonialism is violence. And where there might have been a musket versus a spear or a boomerang, it's, a AK, it's an AK-47 versus an F-16 or an Apache helicopter in a nuclear armed state. That violence is manifest and when we um, speak to politicians about Australia's reaction and the incongruity between our people that come to our protests our brothers and sisters in the struggle for freedom for all people about Australia's reaction I have to uh, often they don't understand the context between our like-minded countries when um, Malcolm Turnbull was our prime minister this war criminal Netanyahu visited Australia and the shaking of hands was so violently, enthusiastically, because we were like-minded countries, and because we are, we are racist settler colonies that have been built on the death and destruction of an Indigenous people. And that Anthony Albanese's reaction, Peter Dutton's reaction, our country's reaction was reflex, like you might do for a fly. Indigenous people struggling against the empire, Indigenous people struggling against settler colonialism, well, you shoe fly, you know, that's what you do. So we should not be surprised by the reaction of our oppressors, whether it's here or wherever it else, it might be in other settler colonies. The, the, what those in power don't understand, what they can't understand, is the reaction of the public. The reaction of the public, they expected the reaction from, they expected a reaction from us, Arabs. And I'll say Arabs, Muslims, and Christians. And they expected perhaps a reaction from not Arabs, but from Muslims who aren't Arab, Muslim, or Christian. They expected some response, but not this response. And they were unaware that there was somebody called others. Beings. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, and in all the rallies I've been around uh, this continent, overwhelmingly under 30, overwhelmingly that haven't, have bypassed the um, gatekeepers that are Murdoch and Stokes and Nine and Channel uh, 2GB and 3AW and all those other clickbait news sites that are part of empire and part of capitalism. And they've seen live on their handheld devices or their screens, a digital genocide. Children have left school and gone on strike because they've seen an entire population lose a school year, see every education facility from primary, secondary to tertiary destroyed, and said, my leader, quote unquote, is not speaking up about it. 
And there's a disconnect with how I feel and how I'm being represented. I got sent a picture today from Harmony Day in a, a school in Melbourne with these five gorgeous kids, three in T-shirts, two in kefirs, not one of them with a drop of Palestinian blood, but each of them with a Palestinian heart, um, expressing their solidarity with Palestine. And it's so, so uplifting for us. History, when we were going to year seven or year eight in history, we did um, timelines of empires, you know, the Roman Empire intersecting with the, you know, et cetera, et cetera, or the other way around. And that, that was sort of bar charts. History will remember October 6th as peak Israel, peak Israeli settler colonialism, because that's as good as it ever got. Because everything that any act that Palestine has ever said about what Zionism is, white supremacy, settler racist colonialism, given the chance with Western impunity, and Australia confers some of that to Israel in, in military support, in Pine Gap, and I'll come to that in a second, but in domestic um, media support, but also throughout the world. Israel exists the way it does because of terrible other, quote unquote, white countries, Western civilization, the global north. And the entire world has now seen the hypocrisy of world rules-based order, the hypocrisy of um, democracy, the hypocrisy of international law, because the playbook that was rolled out when Russia invaded Ukraine was hypocrit hypocritically not rolled out for the Palestinians. The brown deaths were uh, acceptable in pursuit of uh, settler colonialism. The global south, seven ninths of the world, but every one of the O's, the other people that haven't had their brains uh, completely manipulated by the Murdochs, the Stokes, mainstream media, etc., and many well-meaning older people that disconnected from the matrix, if you will, um, the future is assuredly ours. The future is assuredly ours on so many fronts, on an environmental front, on an education front, on health fronts, on Indigenous rights fronts. The challenge is, unfortunately, is the struggle between now and then. Um, and I say to people who lose some heart, the, the, the doing the right thing is never the wrong thing. It might not be the easiest thing, but the journey to liberation means you'll be surrounded by the people that join me on the panel tonight, the people that are watching, and we are the very best of humanity. When, if we were just to take some of the simplest bits of um, the, the uh, Ten Commandments, if NASA's got a loaf of bread and Amy doesn't have anything, then NASA and Amy have half a loaf of bread each. If Amy doesn't have a house, then there are two people in NASA's house. And if as human beings, we can each see each other as equals and believe in that, then that is the best of, of the world we're looking for. With respect to Australia and its complicity with Pine Gap, there's not much I can add to what Richard was saying, but it is very real, our complicity. Aside from the impunity we give, our complicity exists uh, and, and in defence stuff that uh, the Greens and David Shoebridge has done, but also we know from some of the stuff that Edward Snowden released and, and Richard spoke about. Israel is getting this data and it is um, as militarised um, uh, state and it exports that weaponry. We've uh, committed a billion Australian dollars to uh, Elbert Systems that on its website proudly boasts about its technology being battle-tested and battle tested. I mean, the, the marketing speak for we've killed Palestinian children with this stuff and it'll work for you to be able to control your, your own populations. Um, one of the things that has given me such great heart in this past 171 days, and I'll tell you that I, on the 9th or 10th of October, I was curled in a ball in the corner because I know my father spent his entire life advocating for and dreaming of a free Palestine. Died guilty because he had never paid the ultimate sacrifice and so many others had suffered so greatly compared to him and that he guiltily lived as a settler and been able to provide his, for his family. That here I was with three semi-adult children, um, you know, quite adult, I hope they're not, you know, as soon as they see this, they'll be very upset with me. Three adult children, 
um, who realized that in fact, everything my father had done, their grandfather, everything I had done was not going to liberate them from the need to in fact spend their lifetime speaking about this. That was October 10, that next 163, 68 days or whatever it might be, I've been uplifted. And that's a sliver of a silver lining in, in, in seeing the um, intersectionality of our connectedness um, to, to meet with um, Uyghur uh, leaders, as uh, obviously our Indigenous brothers and sisters here, but um, West Papuans yesterday at, at a, a farewell drinks uh, for, for Senator Janet Rice. I'm in Canberra at the moment. Um, and, and just to see that connection, but also see an uplifting in knowledge and idea and connection around Palestine, but understanding that Palestine is in fact part of everything. The solution in Palestine connects to the right to housing here. It connects to indigenous rights and not having resources plundered in Turtle Island. It's connected to Treaty in Aotearoa. It's connected to West Papua, to Western Sahara, to the Congo, Haiti. All of our struggles are interlinked and together, together our fight, uh, it, it's a beautiful struggle and something we should all be very willing to, if necessary, die for because our liberty is assured if we fight together. And I thank you all for the opportunity and I'm sorry I went a little bit too long. Thank you so much, Nassan. You didn't go too long because I think it was the same with Richard. I was just getting so engrossed by what you're saying, but I, I think you're totally right. And I think it's why Palestine has shown us just how connected we are, but how connected we are in our resistance as well. And that they've, there is a feeling of a collective Indigenous resurgence. And I think that comes into um, leading back to Pine Gap and where Pine Gap is on traditional Arunta country, which is from my understanding, it never had the consent of traditional owners. Um, but in a place like Alice, um, where there is such intense colonial surveillance, and when we talk about surveillance, we're not just talking about US imperialism, Australian um, military and complicity and what's happening in Gaza, we're talking about a racialized surveillance that has worked against the bodies of black people and has been used in that settler colonial project in ways that is being used in Gaza and against indigenous peoples across the world. And um, Catherine, I wanted to bring you in relation to that into the role of colonial surveillance, particularly where you are right now um, in Alice. At this very minute, I'm in Darwin, but usually <laughs> I'm in Alice. And there's just a couple of points that I wanted to, to grab hold of. So, Richard, in that NSA document where it says Israel enjoys having this level of this level of information come to it, and then NASA, your point around the almost bragging rights that Israel has around this, the six day war, or the you know the precision, the apparent like those bombs don't discriminate, and they know that, but they have this oh, no, we've got this data that says that Hamas, you know, is operating out of this fishing shack. And so much of it is probably fabricated, but so much of it is coming out of this relationship. And there was just something about on that NSA document that Israel enjoys this information. And I was like, there's something particularly sick around that. And there's something particularly sick around um, their, their, their blatant and flagrant, flagrant. So they didn't expect the world to react like it has. <laughs> and so when NASA, you were saying they expected like the diaspora of Palestinians to react and possibly um, other Muslims to react, but they didn't expect the world to react like it did. And I think I agree with you. The future is ours. They they invested so heavily in don't believe your lying eyes. Don't believe, oh, look at these naive woke people who are looking at this, you know, this absolute um like colonial, like this colonialism happening in real time. Yes. These bombs being dropped in real time, these images being sent around the world in real time back again without the benefit of those 
massive satellite towers. So it's almost like this, the arrogance of, you know, Israel and to use casual language like enjoy or the arrogance of them to say, um, do you know, our superior technology because what they didn't ever count on is the inferior technology actually coming from the superior cultures. So this that sits here, the future is ours because we were taught, even in as you were curled in that ball on October 9th, you know, the information flow was changing. And so, and people stopped saying, I'm not going to let you tell me what I should believe. So there were literally, you know, the mainstream media, there were this narrative of defence, this narrative of, you know, needing to do this, this narrative around don't believe what you see. Don't, you know, your eyes are lying to you. And it just doesn't work anymore. And so that's one thing that we can just take comfort in because like in the 80s when 400 people were arrested down at Pine Gap, like these mass community protests. And Aunty Barb, like when you said, no, hey, this is Orinda land. I had permission from Orinda people to be there. I'm not even going to accept your... I'm not pleading guilty to what I know to be a true statement. I had permission from our under people. And the court's not going to want to argue with you because they know, because they don't actually want to get into that argument. And so, I mean, they'll get into like an argument, but on that small scale, that was an admission. It was an admission that they knew damn well what was going on and that they didn't want to kind of argue that point. So you got community service and you got to serve scones, but you made a massive, massive national statement. Like, I was only like a young woman then, and the wave that came from those early protests were, you know, everyone was talking about it, and still do in Alice Springs, still do talk about it. You know, when everybody came together, and that's what's also happening now, we're coming together in ways that um, is a little bit unprecedented and a little bit um, because we are all standing together. So I forgot what my question was because I just wanted to go back to those two points. Our surveillance. Um, the surveillance happens in in multiple ways. The Northern Territory it's probably no accident that Pine Gap was chosen to be there. I mean, strategically, I'm sure it, it makes sense, but it's certainly no accident that the Northern Territory emergency response was ready and waiting in order to remove people from land and to disempower whole populations. And it's certainly no coincidence that, I don't know if any, everyone knows that the Stronger Futures ended technically, the Stronger Futures legislation ended technically in July last year. And so just as this social experiment that had happened in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, but across the, the whole of the Northern Territory was about to be over, the noise rose again. The narrative rose again, all of a sudden, Sky News and Seven and everybody's on the courthouse lawns in Mbantua looking, digging like rats for dirt about something that they can say, the next salacious scandal that they can say to demonise. So now we're in the, to demonise Aboriginal people in the Territory. And what I will say is these sites of really strong cultural and linguistic strength are always the ones that are targeted with the most relentlessly negative narrative. I'm not going to talk about what's happening in Alice Springs at this minute, but generally we have stations that are unmanned police stations where there's a police officer and they are constantly recording. So they put them in areas so that it's a constant state of surveillance. And that is for our own protection, apparently. That is for our 
So everything is clouded in this kind of benevolence that we never ever get to really address. So the Northern Territory emergency response, the rivers of grog, the you know child pedophile rings, the you know stronger futures were supposed to end in July, and so then the chatter around, you know, even Kerry Ann Kennelly, like in direct response to tens of thousands of people coming out in Melbourne, in Nam, and saying, maybe we should just think about January 26th. Maybe we should just be having a conversation about that. In direct response to that, she says, oh, that's all well and good, but women and children are being raped in the outback. Just nothing, nothing to do with it. But all of these narratives that are created, they are, they are deliberately created to dehumanise. And if we go back to, um, and I think we're going to talk about the media in a minute, but I, I shared a story with my friend. I was over in Canada and he grew up in a kibbutz and we were having this really kind of brutally honest conversation and he said, I just didn't know. And I was like, I know exactly what that is. I know exactly what that is to be part of a colonial government that deliberately keeps its population ignorant so at the same time as all of this surveillance is happening all of this top down is just saying don't believe what you're seeing don't believe any of this don't you know aboriginal people are perfectly happy under the intervention you know all of these kind of stories that exist to keep the general population ignorant and and it it exists for one reason is because if the general population wasn't ignorant. They would never, ever let the things that are happening now happen. So, because humanity as a whole, you know, applies across everything. My friend then put up this map of Palestine with the food produce of what was produced in what area. And I don't know why it was that map that just broke me because as a, we know what it is to be deliberately dislocated from traditional country, it's like deliberately removed, that connection broken and put into highly concentrated areas with people who often shouldn't, you know, be in highly concentrated areas together. And we know what it is to have this form of systemic control, whether it's a mission manager or it's a Gaza border or it's a you know, unmanned drone or it's those satellites, they're the same thing. And the Northern Territory intervention, as it applies in, you know, now still, it was supposed to end in July. And I can't even explain how you can see it rising. Oh, there's trouble in town. Oh, there's, and then the next, and I guess my bigger question is why do we need to look so hard for the negative and just when there's so much positive and strength as well why does our country celebrate that why do what's our really possessive investment in ignorance what is that why are we so possessively invested in it that we would have late line they lied we know that they lied that botox nurse who filmed that fight at the front of Uncle's Tavern and then saw her minute to go on Sky News. She was on Carl Stefanovic. They were, she was on five or six different channels. She lied. She blatantly lied. So she had her little moment of fame. She saw that fight. I'm sure she was scared, whatever. I don't know why she was terrified for her life because she was filming a fight between two adults. But it goes further and she's saying these things like, she just lied. She made it up. Oh, there's anal warts on two-year-olds. Fabricated. And it's all designed to be able to just keep these systems of control in place. So now we have this even more restrictive. Today there's a curfew in place where 17-year-olds have to be home by six. Everyone under 18 does. And, you know, the bottle shops are shut on Mondays and Tuesdays across the board in Alice Springs. So if you're a visitor, I had like these American visitors over 
And I was like, oh, my God, I don't want to encourage this, but we'll just hoard a little bit now in case we want to have a dinner party on Tuesday night. Do you know what I mean? Because this is what it does. It creates these kind of social behaviours then. So I'll just leave it at that because I'm, but I'm profoundly moved by your opening, Amy, and I'm profoundly kind of shocked but not shocked, Richard, by um, that information. I didn't know about those towers. I didn't know how directly those towers were feeding information straight back. And I am profoundly shocked by the arrogance of all three nations. And I'll just say one final thing. So, so NASA, we are with you and you are with us and they do not anticipate and they are completely fearful of this level of solidarity and this level of information sharing that's coming out through forums like this. So there is no combat to forums like this. We're sharing our own stories. Um, oh, no, I've forgotten now the last thing. I've had very little sleep. Oh, I'll there, come back to it later, though. I'll throw back to it. I'll remember in a minute. And I just wanted to say to the panel as well, feel free to respond to um, everyone. I realise, like, everyone's on mute, so it's a bit difficult when you're on Zoom. But there were so many things that you said, particularly um, around the use of surveillance in justifying control, the use of lies, which we are seeing continually from the Israeli government and the IDF. They lie through their teeth even when there is no evidence, um, as we have seen. Um, and when you raised Al Shufa, um, Richard, I thought, you know, the lies about um, the hospitals. Yeah. And then when we see the data coming from Pine Gap, I remember just being totally shocked by that and you tracing it through the Washington Post. And I think there's a perfect segue um, for Peter, who has been fighting to tell these stories and is now telling them through independent media. But Peter, I just wanted to ask you why are these issues about complicity, about Pine Gap, about what's happening in Gaza? Why do you think they're not being properly um, represented in Australian mainstream media? Um, and even if you want to include your own experiences in that. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Amy. <clears throat> appreciate the opportunity and, and my respect to uh, Auntie Barb and hi to Catherine, Richard, Nasser. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to, um, to say that Everything to do with Gaza is a hot potato for Australian media. media. We've seen uh, unprecedented levels of call, public calls by Australian journalists for their own employers, their own editors, to be more impartial. Now, you know, I've been around for a couple of years and I've never, never heard such a thing in my life. And hundreds of journalists have made these calls through their union, through their workplaces. A lot of them have been... Uh, you know, rebuffed by their, their managers, but they've made the statements. And I noticed today there's a, I think Al Jazeera published an FOI on the ABC and found a document that ABC staff had put together. And it's just remarkable in, in the problems that ABC staff are having just in reporting facts. Now, journalism isn't that hard. I mean, if I can do it, most people can do it. You just got to look around for facts pile them all together um, and, uh, and find an outlet for them. You do need a little bit of history, though, because otherwise good facts fall down the memory hole. The, the whole Yom Kippur uh, involvement of Pine Gap, the war back in 73, um, you know, I'd forgotten about for now. But, yeah, it's there. And you just got to Google it. Like, it's not hidden information. It's not secret information. It's just disappeared information. So unless it gets repeated in the media on a regular basis, things drop off the back, they fall down the back of the couch. And uh, the media's role is not just reporting events now, but also reporting events in the context of the past. Because so much of what we are seeing in Gaza, the, well, the, the forced famine, uh, that's not new. Ask the people of East Timor. I think they lost 130,000 people died because of the Indonesian army's forced famine in the late 70s. The, um, I mean, ask the Irish 200 years ago, 300 years ago, forced famine killed a million or more. Forced famine is a tool of war. And I think Human Rights Watch said that and got an ABC journalist in trouble for, for retweeting. But I mean, these facts are known by all the staff at the ABC, but there's, there's a tight editorial control in what can be said. 
and you know, I feel I feel for them, and uh, I, I think a lot of journalists there, despite the controls, are doing tremendous work. We're seeing a lot of great reports coming out. We're seeing some ordinary ones as well, but we are seeing some good ones. And you should be, you know, appreciating those and repeating those and sending them around because the more that uh, good quality coverage gets repeated, the stronger those journalists will be to keep doing it. So why does Gaza get why has it become a hot potato? Well, anything to do with uh, the United States and military action around the world is a, is a contentious uh, matter for, for journalists who report on international affairs. Um, it's no surprise that therefore the US uh, proxy war via, uh, by Israel against the Palestinians is a touchy subject for the gatekeepers to keep a lid on. But, um, um, in terms of the role of Pine Gap, I'd, I'd done some reporting on it um, back in 2017 for a background briefing program. And, you know, it was a pretty straightforward thing. Just like I say, journalism is pretty straightforward. You just collect information. So I thought, oh, yeah, well, I wonder if the Ken Snowden uh, people know anything about Pine Gap. And, yeah, they, there were some documents amongst his collection, apparently. So I, I used them to put together the, the story that I did on on ABC Radio National. And here we are four years down the track and oh, hang on, five, seven years down the track. And I, I waited a month for, for someone, anyone to report on Pine Gap following the, uh, the, the, the October um, commencement of the, 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 you know, the outgoing conflict that's happening at the moment. And, um, and just in frustration, I, I didn't think I should be writing it. I thought mainstream could do it. I just yeah, pumped out a, another quick article just to remind people, not to tell people new information, but just to remind people. For example, uh, Richard mentioned the NSA has got a, an intelligence relationship with ISNU, the Israeli SIGINT National Unit. Well, I'd kind of, maybe I read the original Intercept article that had that in it, but I'd forgotten all about it. So. Um, a lot of this information is available. Media uh, journalists, you know, are hu hurried. I mean, one of the things I'd suggest is you send good links to good journalists, send good information to good journalists. And I think people would really appreciate it. I know that when I was working at the ABC, it's a, it's a non-stop, full, flat out, difficult job. Um, and uh, that's one of the things worthwhile doing. Um, but this, this war is different for the media. In the past, we've had, um, I mean, East Timor again, it, it broke out as an issue into the public mind when a, a single journalist with a digicam video filmed an Israeli, uh, sorry, his Indonesian massacre. That changed everything for East Timor. That was 91, I think, from memory. And, um, and it never again could people deny. I mean, I think Gareth Evans at the time called it an aberration, but when you see 200 odd people being shot and bludgeoned to death, uh, in colour on the widescreen television. It's a bit hard to deny. So that changed everything. Well, I think social media has changed everything this time around. The media can't walk away and tuck this story behind the couch. This is a story that every day people are dying and social media is telling us. It's already slipped off the news agenda and we don't see nearly as much reporting of it as we did. But, but you know, it's almost like there's a people's intelligence network that's operating using social media, using the internet to keep people in touch with what's going on because, you know, people may have a flick through the mainstream media and, and not see anything or much on Gaza and then, and then jump into the socials and, you know, from Al Jazeera through to all sorts of sources, you, you can find good quality, checkable, verifiable information. So, so I think... I think that's been a fundamental change. Ten years since we really got the the iPhone going, and and this is the the one that's that's changed it all. And we can never go back and pretend we didn't know what colonialism does. We can no longer call it an aberration. You know, uh, once upon a, when I was younger, massacres would occur in a column called the World in the Sydney Morning Herald. It'd be a paragraph about eight inches down from the top. And would be a paragraph about, you know, 120 people killed in some riot in some wherever. But now 
Now, there's people living in Australia who are probably from there who've got internet connections and are telling us the news. We can't walk away from it, so the media can't walk away from it as well. And therefore, it's, um, it's time to explain it and to delve back into the memories, to pull a few things out of the memory holes and to revisit, for example, Pine Gap. Um, there's been a, a, a lot of reporting on Pine Gap. It's one of the most reported on uh, in, uh, US uh, spy bases in the world. I mean, Richard uh, and, and his colleagues has done an enormous amount of work and I really commend you to go to the Nautilus website to have a look at the reports that have been compiled over the years. Just incredible amount of information, the best in the world that Richard and, and the others have, have done. So, um, so there's no excuse to, if, 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 if you're interested in finding out more and sending that out to the world through your own independent media or to journalists who you might know that may be sympathetic, so important to get that information out there because information is power. And that power uh, tells Australians that, uh, gee, the, the South African action in the International Court of Justice may not be such a remote thing maybe we've got some connection to it. Maybe the monitoring and the work done through Pine Gap uh, is equipping people to violate the laws of armed conflict, to commit war crimes. And if that's the case, given that we still have the old idea of sovereignty, and this is Australia, we're Australian citizens, we should know and agree to what goes on here, then maybe we can ask some questions. Now the, um, the, the, the questions are obvious, and that is, what's the legal position on Pine Gap? What is the legal position for staff at Pine Gap to be doing what they're doing? Uh, what is the legal position for uh, journalists to be reporting on it? I, I sent a set of questions to the Australian Defence Department before I published that article on Pine Gap back in November asking just these sort of questions. You know, what are the legal protections you've got in place for staff? And, um, you know, they, they didn't reply. And, um, uh, you know, I'm first so disappointed that, uh, that they wouldn't engage on the issue. Um, Can we just go to Peter's point as well? At what is the point at which a veto is implemented. Well, we, we have a we have a there's that statement that's really well known uh, amongst people that follow Pine Gap and things, and it's called full knowledge and concurrence. And the Australian government always refers back to it and says, "Well, we have full knowledge and concurrence of what occurs on um, in Pine Gap." Well, I had to Google concurrence because I'm not really. I sort of got a vague idea and had to sort of make sure that I I understood it. And when I did that and anyone can do this, up popped a statement by Richard Miles from last year, 12 months ago, where he talked about what it meant. And now we know what it means. Richard Miles said, it doesn't mean, it does not necessarily mean Australia approves of each individual activity or task undertaken. Instead, it means we agree to the purpose of activities uh, conducted. We are aware of the capabilities being used and we understand their expected outcomes. So that really shook me in, in that concurrence doesn't mean that we have to give permission for it to happen. We basically have an overall agreement that they can stick the spy base there and we will just then understand the outcomes. We won't control them. So Australia is really abrogating its responsibility there in, in my view. Nonetheless, it can't escape uh, what's happening with the International Court of Justice. Yeah. If it does conclude in a month or two's time that war crimes have been committed in Israel, well, the defence lawyers better have their paperwork lined up because they're going to be examined. Um, uh, the staff at Pine Gap, I'd recommend they ask for an email from their superiors uh, guaranteeing that there is a legal protection of the tasks they do because this issue is not going to go away. It's, it's broken out um, like, like never before. And even if mainstream media doesn't cover it enough, you can get onto the internet and follow it yourself. So mm. I think that um, media has got a very strong role to play in this in informing people. 
people have then got a very strong role to play in acting upon their knowledge. So I, I don't think uh, journalists are heroes or, or, or I've done anything that anyone else couldn't do, but I think it's, um, I think it's so important that, that once that knowledge is gained, that that knowledge then be used to ask questions of parliament, get questions asked in parliament, ring up your local member, ask people what the hell is going on. And journalists attending uh, the next uh, uh, press conference where, where Richard Miles is um, speaking could, could just ask, you know, whether he's satisfied that the outcomes are acceptable to Australians. Are the outcomes of the intelligence being used by Israel in Gaza, is that acceptable to all Australians? Mm. It's a straightforward question. I'd love to hear his reply. But that's all journalists do. They just ask questions and I think, yeah, boy, is there a few to ask. Yeah. So thanks, Richard, for your, your, your excellent work in digging this information out. Uh, and to NASA, Barb and Catherine for, um, and Amy for reminding us of the, the commonalities between the colonial struggles that are occurring around the world, including here. Um, and, yeah, information's power and, and the people, you know, need to make use of it if they can, in any way they can. There was something really heartbreaking about the South African mm. um, argument around intent and looking at it and relating that back to our struggles as well. But then there was something really positive about that South African foreign minister coming out and saying, we will arrest you if you have participated in this. Mm. But also we know what it is to have the world ignore when these things are happening to us. Ireland stood up in, an, in a way like no other. Scotland stood up. Pakistan has stood up. It's all of these countries that know, all these people that know what it is mm -hmm. to live under like a colonial rule that are just saying, actually, in our solidarity, we won't let you do this anymore. I think one of the things, sorry, Em. No, no, you're right. You can, you go no, now. I was going to say, one of the things that uh, has elevated the understanding of the world of what's going on is that citizen journalism, the fact that that iPhone Pedia talked about 10 years ago, that we've been able to bypass the gatekeepers. And when we talk about genocide, the reality of plausible genocide to an actual finding of genocide, the finding of genocide is going to be seven or eight or perhaps 10 years from today as it happened in Bosnia and Rwanda. And, you know, we're still waiting for them to classify the genocide of Turtle Island here, Aotearoa, um, you know, what what uh, Leopold did in, in, in the Congo for, yeah, for Britain yeah. and rubber. Um, yeah. That in fact, aside from the Palestinian citizen journalism, one of the things that, um, you know, we, we talk about, we share with Israel uh, is that we're democracies. That this isn't Benjamin Netanyahu, this is Israel's democracy has got this guy there. It's not Benjamin Netanyahu. It's a democracy. The citizens have elected this guy. But the Palestinian uh, vision is also mirrored with the Israeli vision, where they're in a, a decimated house, gloating over the fact that they've destroyed it and killed people and shot, um, uh, you know, horrific crimes, driving over corpses, letting dogs and they're eat. they're dancing? Um, and they're dancing in women's lingerie. That there's a, a aside from what we're showing and what they're actually self uh, identifying, on top of what the South Africans presented with respect to language of leadership and, and what's happened, it's a, a measure of a society that is deeply, deeply broken. And that is connected here. So when you have that language of, uh, uh, you know, quote unquote, white woman with tears, warts on babies. It's the same uh, uh, babies, um, uh, genital warts on, on children is the same as 40 beheaded babies. And you, you know, as we create, manufacture it that- is the exact yes, it, you same get the thing, thing. Where the colonized mind goes, well, they're not like us. Of course you can do whatever you need to do. And of course, whatever you need to do is locking up kids in Dondale, you know, um, uh, uh, coroner court after coroner court, you know, Indigenous kid after Indigenous kid. And if you look at the parallels between incarceration rates, income disparities, educational outcomes, infant mortality, you know, type 2 diabetes, all the stuff that you measure civilised societies by, the parallels between 
Palestinian outcomes and indigenous outcomes here, West Papuans, uh, 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 Maori brothers and sisters, Polynesians, uh, Hawaii, to, you know, they're all layered and they all look the same because it's the same evil shit. Label. And one beautiful statistic that people don't often talk about that Australia and Israel share, it's the highest incidences of skin cancers because that white skin ain't, ain't indigenous to brown dirt. You're welcome. <laughs> Say sorry, land back, <laughs> sovereignty, and we'll slap on the SP50 for you. <laughs> um, Ani Bob, did you want to? I just realized the time and that we have so many questions as well, and there's a lot of like action focused questions that I wanted to come to. But Ani Bob, did you want to respond to anything? Um, you just got mute on, you got the mute on. There you go. Uh, thanks, Amy. Look, I just I'll try and be quick. Um, in the 80s, there wasn't so much information about what was happening at Pine Gap. In fact, what we did know was that uh, the Australian government leased that land for a peppercorn a year. That was the amount of the lease. We were concerned about Alice Springs being a first strike facility in those days. And if the Soviet Union were going to send a missile across to the States, um, the US had uh, the satellite over Alice Springs, which would warn them. But at the same time, they had no obligation to warn the Australian government what was happening. The thing about the big demonstration in 1988, where 500 people were arrested, was that I see Deborah Dern and other people online who were part of that. The Alice Springs Peace Group were a very small organization, maybe 20 people or less. But we trained nonviolent direct action training and all those people were to come, able to come together. And there, there were cells of four people who worked together. You know, one was a person who was going to make sure you got bailed if you got arrested. Another one was going to help you over the fence. Uncle Bob Anderson from Brisbane, from Indian, was the one that held up the fence to me. Um, and I think that another mass demonstration to support um, the Gaza people and to raise issues about Aboriginal genocide, land, Royal Commission into deaths in custody not being implemented, you know, only one. And that was the one for the body count. That's the only, only uh, recommendation out of over 300. So I'm saying, wouldn't it be just so wonderful if once again we could get a core group of people to bring together a mass demonstration at Pine Gap because that's where the information is going to the Israelis and Aboriginal people as well. Catherine, I'm sure, and and um, and people in Mabadwa, you know, who've always been hospitable to outsiders. That that would be such a great thing to do, and I'm sure that that would shake the government somehow. They mightn't do anything about it, but they'd certainly be shaken. Yep. I, I think that brings us um, just the power of resistance and Black mm -hmm. advocacy and how long it has been existing. Um, but it also brings us so clearly into, like, most of the questions, and I have no idea how we're going to get through. Most of, most of the questions are really action oriented. How they're going to use this information from Professor Tanda, from Peter, from NASA, from Bob and Catherine um, in the continual fight to actually, you know, stop this genocide and to make known Australia's complicity in genocide. Um, and so there's a number of questions for um, Richard, particularly in relation to Pine Gap, um, but also about what we can do specifically. So Imogen, it's something that um, Honey Bob just touched on. How can we protest Pine Gap effectively? But Kim also asked, how do we hit reverse and back out? How do we force governments to do so? So that's very much what can people on the ground actually do? Can Pine Gap be closed? Another person asked that. What is the responsibility there? I don't know who, Richard, would you like to end? Okay, very quickly. Um, I think uh, Ali Barbie is exactly right. What happened in the 80s, not you know, the past is wonderful on the contrary, but there was an example where it worked really, really well. 
And I think when Barb went over the fence and I went over the fence and another thousand people went over the fence, it got a publicity. On the other side, on the other hand, I noticed that Margaret Pistorius is on the uh, in is participating um, in the chat, and she and uh, four other colleagues um, uh, participated in a, um, a perfect civil disobedience action of walking over the fence uh, in 2015 or 16. Forgive me, I can't remember, um, and uh, lamenting the dead that Pine Gap was causing. In those days, they were particularly focusing on the roles in Afghanistan and um, uh, uh, in in Iraq, as well as nuclear victims of, of nuclear war that Park Pine Gap is very deeply involved in. And they sang. And they were set on trial, all five of them, and one other person, Paul Christie. And that got an extraordinary level of publicity. And we're still talking about it six, seven years later. So about mass demonstrations and very carefully planned civil disobedience is, is really, really important. And I absolutely support what both Barbara um, and Catherine have said about that. The second thing is, what can be done? Well, a couple of things. One is, you know, on the negative side, this is the alliance with America we're talking about. This is absolutely the core of the alliance which Australian governments have had since um, the, the late 1940s. Um, the one that sent us to war uh, in countries like Vietnam, Korea, uh, Iraq, Iraq, how many times? Three times uh, since then, and it goes on. And I think Nasser has made the point very clearly of who are the targets. Um, the downside is Pine Gap is the it, Pine Gap is what America cares about in Australia. Kangaroos are nice. Um, the money they make out of us is nice. The fact that Australia will send a few troops off. Um, um, to approved wars is useful, um, but they don't really care about that. What they care about is Pine Gap's extraordinary capabilities, and now we are supplementing under both the Morrison government and the Albanese government by offering um, uh, raf based Tyndall just up the road from, from where, well, in both um, uh, Catherine and Adi Baba, now, or up and down the road, depending on where you are, um, to host American nuclear-capable B-52 bombers. Now, these are aimed, these are part of what's aimed at China. This is extraordinarily important and a big change that nobody's paying any attention to. So it is these military roles that make Pine Gap important for the Americans. The downside is, as um, Peter made very clear, every time I talk to a senior Labor politician, they say, oh, look, you know, don't, don't. Don't, don't, don't worry the horses. We really need, we, you know, remember what happened to Gough. We can't do anything that upsets Pine Gap and the Americans. So if you want to do something else, you've got to behave on Pine Gap. Well, quite frankly, bugger that. Um, I think we need to make it very clear that as hundreds of thousands of Australians are protesting about Palestine every week, as far as I can see, I think that's going to spill over into Pine Gap when people are aware of what's happened. But it's a huge fight. That should be very clear. I agree. Did anyone else want to respond to that question about what we can do as resistance or what practically can be done? Um, there are so many questions. Um, one of the other ones that came up, um, Mercedes asks, right now there is an increasing level of interest in the role of arms companies operating in Australia and their role in the genocidal war on Gaza. Um, with this in mind, can Richard tell us something of the companies who operate Pine Gap on behalf of the NRO? Yep. Um, and what percentage of Pine Gap workers are employed by companies as opposed to military? I knew you'd ask that. Um, it's in things I've written. About 25%, I think, is the answer, are employed by contractors. Distinguish between contractors, individual people, as contractors in the Australian economy, but the big um, corporate contractors, the names are ones you are very familiar with, Boeing, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, and then a whole lot of what are called pure play companies, which are really strictly uh, involved in military things. The actual antennas are actually operated mostly by contractors, but there are also military people there. So half and half Australian, but about... From memory, about 50% of the Americans are contractors. 
And, uh, but that's actually, I think, in the IGIS submission, uh, that information, certainly a link that you, you can find, you can find to that. So this is big corporate money. What we had, I noticed that Michelle Fay was um, participating in the chat earlier on. She runs an extraordinary um, publication called um, Undue Influence, um, and that documents exactly that in the Australian arms trade. And she and her colleagues and my other colleague, uh, Kelly Tranter, have been following this you know, very, very carefully. The truth is that Australia is small beer in arms production. What we have are the branch offices of all those other companies, Northrop Grumman Australia, um, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, uh, Kim Beasley, was on the board. Of, oh, I can't recall whether it was Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin. There's extraordinary kind of overlap. So I, th I think it's really important to look at the arms, arms exports but they're actually relatively small in our case, enormous in the American and British and German cases, relatively small in ours, except for a couple of specialist companies, which we should be going after. But that's why I actually talk about Pine Gap. That's the big one. That's the big one for Israel. It's the big one for the Americans. Um, another question that had come in is from Lee. Considering what happened to Gulf Whitlam's prime ministry after he showed dissent to Pine Gap's existence on this continent, does our government actually have any authority over Pine Gap at all? Um, but what happened to Whitlam is complicated, um, and I, I probably won't go into it. There is a very, very good book by James Curran from the University of Sydney called uh, Nixon and Whitlam at War, which goes through that, uh, that whole episode long over three years. Extraordinary documents. The name is Curran, C-U-R-R-A-N, uh, Whitlam and Nixon, Nixon and Whitlam at war, the other way around. Um, it's very good. On the core question, does Australia have any authority? Yes. A Minister of Defence and a Prime Minister of National Security of Cabinet could decide to say, thanks very much, United States. The treaty says we're allowed to terminate after whatever the period of notice is, one year or three years, I can't now recall. And um, uh, could you please get it in order and clean up after you? But of course... What the question is asking about is the political response to that. It's not the political response from America that worries me. It's the political response inside Australia, which would come from the Liberal Party and the Labor Party um, to stop any such uh, such approach. That's the real problem. What's... Can I, I, I tell you, we would get a dose of democracy. Oh, we certainly would. We've had it. We've had it several times, without a doubt. But what I mean is... That American power is embedded inside inside our political system. And um, what's politely called the bipartisan uh, foreign policy and defence policy, which means just shut up and let us allow get on and do with the other things, that is what really broke on, on all of the issues we're talking about today. Exactly that. And it is possible to do it. It was possible to do it during the Vietnam War. It did it. And Whitlam pulled the troops out of uh, out of Vietnam. It took a hell of a lot of work and a long time, but it's that's the way to do it. And if you want to look at uh, how our democracy was so impacted, I was a young fellow when I uh, had a shame phrase, a shame term. And the compounding effects on that that gives us Malcolm Fraser, who we thought was the devil, who resigns from the Liberal Party because it is so abhorrent to him. And in his last years, last decades, perhaps, was, you know, an icon who, you know, um, we went to Vietnam, bombed the hell out of it. Of course, we should open our shores and allow boat people here to get to where we are now, um, you know, uh, Rudd, Gillard, Rudd, Abbott, Turnbull, um, ScoMo, and now um, uh, our left Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, who's to the right of the devil. Who's the right of the devil? Malcolm Fraser. Shame, Fraser, shame. That's This is the right. The other right. Um, elbows to the right of Malcolm Fraser. Offshore processing, Pine Gap, the whole kit and caboodle, you know. Fraser 
was remarkable. I worked with him very closely in the last five or six years of his life and on the book that became Dangerous Allies. That's a book which I think is very good. I got really good, particularly the last half of it, where Fraser was really passionately talking about what was wrong, what's changed and what's got wrong. It was a book with a respectable publisher by a former foreign minister. I can't think of a serious media review of it. I can think of one, actually, one serious review of it. And in my trade, the academics just avert their eyes. I mean, Fraser was nuts, wasn't he? I mean, really, how could you take that seriously? Well, it was deadly serious. And he was passionately serious about Pine Gap. And we, somebody mentioned in the chat the International Criminal Court, which is about um, individual uh, being arraigned for war crimes, including genocide. And Fraser and I talked very seriously about the time that we both expected to come when at some point an Australian official worked at Pine Gap will be charged under the International Criminal Court jurisdiction with crimes against humanity for what Pine Gap did or does. In those days, we were specifically talking about drone attacks that Pine, for which Pine Gap supplies the targeting data in countries with which Australia is not at war, which include Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, um, and, and many others, let alone ones that we do have wars with. They're illegal assassinations. Sooner or later, somebody is going to say, this crossed my desk, I saw it happen, I've become a whistleblower, or the evidence is going to come out and eventually you go down from a minister to a secretary of a department to the head of Pine Gap to the person who pressed, who pressed the send button. That is criminal capability. It's something we need to think about. It's very hard. But there have been several cases in Britain about Pine Gap's companion station at Minworth Hill, which got national security certificate slapped on straight away by the courts. But you keep going. You sooner or later you find the crack in the wall. Anyway, sorry, enough on that. Oh, sorry, Peter, did you want to take that? Oh, look, I mean, the, it's a very cynical comment to make, but probably the one thing that will close down Pine Gap will be a couple of Chinese hypersonic missiles. Uh, if if uh, the US, its allies, Australia, keep on pushing China, and if we have a Gulf of Tonkin-style incident that gives us an excuse to go into battle with China, China's not going to stuff around. It knows the role that Pine Gap plays. It doesn't need to read the journalism that I might be involved in or anyone else, Richard's reports. It's got its own way of knowing what Pine Gap does. And just like Russia did during the last Cold War, this Cold War, China has Pine Gap targeted as one of its prime targets. Absolutely. So if, if we don't tackle the issue of Pine Gap and address what it's doing, others will. I think Barb's got a question, a comment. I, I was just going to ask, um, how do you think the AUKUS agreement will um, impact on what Pine Gap is doing? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, the submarines are irrelevant and they're probably not going to happen anyway. They'll just cost us vast amounts of money for it to not to happen. Um, the so-called Pillar 2 stuff, which is largely stuff that's already happening, um, may have some very slight impacts, particularly in the computing stuff. But I, my own impression from a distance is that that stuff is... Um, that Australia and particularly United Kingdom, which is barely existing actually at the moment in many respects, um, that they count, that the stuff in that, that in Pillar 2 they're talking about is stuff the Americans are doing, advanced research stuff. They'll either apply it to Pine Gap or they won't, and we won't get a, um, a say about that. But, but Barb, you mentioned on the importance that in the 1980s um, people paid to the nuclear weapons roles that Pine Gap has. And it's it's just it it tends to get forgotten. I'll, if I may, I'll just very quickly show one slide and then people can have a look. Pine Gap has really important nuclear weapons, which is still there and really important. Um where am I? Beer, beer, beer. I can't. Uh, Don't worry about it. Yeah, you can see it roughly, I think. Um, and 
they are really important. It supports nuclear attack planning. It supports early warning, which might sound defensive, but mm -hmm. what's really the possibility of a nuclear second strike. It supports missile defence, which again is nice if both countries have got it, but if only one's got it, it means it's all going to happen all over again. So um, I just remind people, that's the other side of Pine Gap, which is just so extraordinary and it's very real and Barb's quite right to draw attention to it sorry to intervene there um Jonathan and sorry we're just coming to the end we've got about 15 minutes but Jonathan asked are there any precedents from around the world where citizen action has closed down a military military base and if so what were the ingredients of success has there been a case where you were able to pressure enough and get enough public pressure in order to close something like Pine Gap um I feel like I'm talking a lot of other people might like to jump in there. The immediate things that come to me are the Americans being thrown out of the Philippines. Uh, they're back there now, but for 30 years, I was thrown out during the Marcos, after the Marcos dictatorship. Um, uh, Greenham Common, missile deployment in Britain uh, being stopped. Um, a lot of uh, smaller uh, versions of that. So we don't know. There aren't too many more I can think of. There are other military things, but not giant bases. The Americans don't get pushed out too often. I don't know whether Nasser or Catherine or um, Peter have got a... Oh, there, there is... Um, I, I'm old enough to remember the peace dividend, which was the 10-year period between the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the War on Terror. And in that time, US military bases were being closed. The US military budget was reducing. Uh, it, it's extraordinary to think that peace can demilitarise a country. By just stopping the wars, using detente, using uh, uh, diplomats, send diplomats instead of bombs, and ending the wars that always end in talks anyway, we may as well get the talks started before the mass slaughter. And, and therefore, those bases will close. They will close down if we can get peace to occur. It's kind of a reverse argument. But I lived through the 10 years of peace and I thought, wow, it's it's finally happening. They're closing American military bases left, right, and centre, and they're reducing the budget. And I thought, oh my God, you know, we're, we're entering a real period of peace. Little did I know what was around the corner. So, is it possible, boy? It's it's possible. It's possible. NASA, like this whole conversation and thinking about that continual advocacy currently on the, on the streets to stop the genocide in Gaza. Um, I'm just really interested in what you would take from this conversation as someone who's actively protesting and resisting in relation to how it can be pulled into your own advocacy or how mm -hmm. we could use that pressure around what is happening with Pine Gap um, in relation to the current momentum. Yeah, I, I think, I think increasingly well, more and more people are realising just how aside from the connectedness of our struggle for liberation, but the connectedness of our oppressors in oppressing us, that, that, that system, that hierarchy that sits above us um, is, is not unique as it sits here and it's not unique as it sits in any of the other settler colonies, that what does that look like? And um, I, I know that uh, uh, President Biden uh, Donald Trump won Michigan, a state with a very heavy Arab Muslim other um, constituency. Um, Trump won that and beat uh, the Wicked Witch of the West, um, uh, Hillary. Um, and then Biden won Michigan uh, by 10,000 votes and uh, took the presidency off Trump. That the registered Democrats there turned out went out in line and 110,000 of them ticked a box that says uncommitted uh, in the presidential nominations there. And the Wall Street Journal headline was welcome to Hamas Dan or something like that uh, about uh, how Chicago voted uncommitted and is tilted towards Hamas because Joe Biden is not calling for a ceasefire. Um, and then, you know, must be two and a bit weeks ago, now George Galloway is re-elected into the... Um, into the UK Parliament, he's back at um, uh, and ran almost exclusively on a ticket that was um, 
uh, around Gaza and, and the Labour Party uh, under Keir Stoma, um, you know, abrogating its responsibility to a left, to a constituency that has voted for it. And it's certainly language I've had with our community um, who have, um, as, as refugees, as first generation um, Australians have sought um, acceptance by proximity to power and pro proximity to power has been photo opportunities with leaders. So, you know, you know, Peter Dutton, who said the worst thing that ever happened to Australia was Lebanese migration, um, uh, uh, was welcomed into the biggest mosque, Lebanese mosque in Sydney. Like, but we can get a picture with a guy, you know, um, that 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 connection has been broken now. That connection has been broken. And what does that look like electorally and uh, within our community that has, in the first instance, come to Australia? Yeah, you know, perhaps unskilled, etc., and worked in factories, joined unions, and defaulted Labor because Labor was better on immigration, better on refugees, better on family reunification, workers' rights were workers. Um, and there's that muscle memory for voting Labor that, you know, I'm saying to them, I'm not saying don't vote Labor, although um, pretty hard now, but I'm saying your vote is valuable, auction it. You know, what are you going to give me? What are you going to give me? And if you're sitting in a seat that is in Western Sydney with a 40% Arab Muslim Christian, let alone other M's, let alone O's, and that and that seat is uh, not representing you in, in a manner that um, not just for me today, Palestine is my number one issue. For Muslims, but Palestine and most Muslims in Australia are not Arab. Um, that for Muslims, in fact, uh, quote unquote, it was a number seven issue, perhaps a number eight issue for, for, for a long time, but the number one issue was our kids being radicalized online and, and finding their way to Afghanistan or Syria or Iraq or whatever it might be. Um, uh, hijabi sisters, you know, being feeling safe on um, public transport, education, um, halal certification. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Palestine was one of them. Today, it's number one for every Muslim. You know? um, so the impacts of that electorally um what that might look like i you know if i was a western sydney labor candidate who had a, enjoyed a 65 35 first party um you know um with preferences majority i'd be absolutely changing my underpants two or three times a day i reckon i don't don't imagine there's not going to be a little bit of um uh galloway people might be galloway across there our election is in a year from now. Will people still be that hot? What does the Labor Party do? Parachute in some quote unquote brown independence. Who knows um, how how hot that community remains? But I, I think there's an activation within our youth as to accountability from our electoral people, and it's certainly something that will make a change. I'm a big fan of direct action. You know those weapons manufacturers and the the crew that have been closing them down for rolling stop at stoppages, the unionists for Palestine and what they've been doing at the docks. It's it's so important when, the, when our governments are not doing what they are obligated to as signatories to the Genocide Convention, it falls upon us as citizens to, to pull our socks up and do the work. Yeah. And Whatever uh, you might think you might have done during Rwanda or the Holocaust or Bosnia is what you would do now. You, people could have not known about the Holocaust. Nobody knew about um, what was happening in the Congo. Rwanda, well, that's black people, really black people. I really don't care. Bosnia, they're kind of Muslims. No one can not know today. No one can say they didn't know. They were, Every one of us can do something. And what that something is, is each of us different. It might be a petition. It might be a rally. It might be a blockade. It might be pulling down a fence. But each of us has an obligation as a shared human in our sh shared humanity to turn the TV off and do something. I think, um, yeah, we at the moment we cannot say we did not know and it's up to all of us to do anything in our capacity. I just realised that we got six minutes and I just wanted to give the clo um, just closing reflections from each of our panellists if you would like to just um, give us maybe one minute in closing about what you want, particularly the, the viewers to take from this conversation. Um, who wanted to go first, Bob or...? Can I go first, Amy, and give my minute to Bob? I've just finished. So, Bob, have two minutes at least. 
Okay. Um, I think it's time for direct action again. You know, um, I think that uh, demonstrations in capital cities are all, all well and good, but I think there needs to be a loud uh, voice to government. And the reason that we got a lot of people together in the 80s was um, to raise awareness and information in the community. And that would be a great vehicle to raise um, by, by people's actions, their concern for people in Gaza and their push for um, Indigenous rights in this country. Catherine, did you want to um, give your reflections? Yeah, sure. Because I completely agree with Aunty Barb that, you know, maybe it's time and it's always been time. And But now, and I agree also with um, NASA, you can't not know. So it's really easy to remain ignorant when, you know, the society keeps you ignorant, but that's just not an excuse now. So we must, we must get up and stand up. And the South African foreign minister, she said the exact same thing. She said, it's time to, you know, turn off the television if the television's telling you lies and get out there and find out the truth. Mm. And so maybe that's our kind of, you know, moral imperative at this minute is just to not, not fall prey to these systems that we know are lying to us and that we can, we must go out and tell our truth as well. This is what this is. This is a, you know, a moment of just truth telling. And so there's a, there's a cynicism around politics and, you know, what the politicians can do, but there's been a shift. There's been a real shift in this last week. You know, the the UN's call for a ceasefire that neither the UK or the US vetoed. The ICJ language that, you know, countries coming out, colonised countries coming out and speaking really directly to people, um, even if it's through the, through the parliaments, there is a change I feel that is happening and you know we kind of have to grab that moment Aunty mm. Barb like you're saying mm. and in the cities and in the regions yeah yes and I think I'm also learning from our elders like Aunty Barb and when you spoke yeah. about Bob Anderson as well it really stuck out to me and just continuing that long legacy of protest and direct action um, can I just say that should be the name of the next the next one Bob Anderson held the fence up for me as I went under because that <laughs> is everything right there <laughs> um Peter just in closing I think um what would you be you know your reflection and your takeaway that you would want people to take from this well, look, like any um, any issue that you, you need to fix, it can only be done by getting good quality information and sharing it. Make sure all your friends know what's going on. Share the good things that you've got. Talk to people. If there's a relative that doesn't get it, explain it to them, and then they'll explain it to the shopkeeper or someone down the road. Just explain as much as possible. And the second thing is to hold meetings. Because no planning can happen, no action can happen, no lobbying, no nothing can happen unless you call meetings. Just call a meeting about people who are interested in the topic and, and pull a couple of articles together and ask them to read them and then say, well, what should we do? It's not hard. People will know the basic threads of democracy, pressure, pulling, pressure pushing, and all those threads need to be pushed big time because otherwise our democracy is moribund. It's just kind of an idea. It's just a kangaroo and an emu on a coat of arms and nothing happens. If you Democracy has to happen. It has to exist and be alive. The media can feed that and then it's up to the people then to pick it up and go for broke because if we sit back and wait for something to change, ain't going to happen. And um, Richard, just in closing, I thought I'd give the last word to you as someone who delivered the paper on um, Pine Gap, what needs to happen now, particularly in relation to, to Pine Gap? Oh, you're just muted. Uh, I mean, there are five fantastic panellists, apart from me, and and Amy and Barb and, and Nasa and Peter and Catherine have said pretty much everything I want to say. Talking about law, talking about something as 
nerdy as writing a complaint to the uh, Inspector General of Intelligence and, and Security. It's a very weak read. But in that document, and I saw that Scott circulated the document in the, in the chat, it's there, and some suggestions about how to then write in your own words, particularly to the Attorney General, uh, Mark Dreyfus. That's where the political emphasis should go. It's a handhold. It's a way to use it. It adds to exactly what Peter was talking about in terms of something to talk about. If we can't get the, survey, the, the Attorney General to say, do you know what we are doing? Do you agree? <laughs> Why are we not vetoing it? How would you veto it? Well, the precious little of the democracy that Peter's talking about left, but it is a sliver. It's there. And with mobilisation, the, all the things that are talked about, uh, especially by Nasser Ani Barb and Catherine, I think are really well worth doing. And I take immense help from, well, I'm in my 70s, but when I talk to people in my 20s and I look at the public opinion polls, Attitudes to Israel have just flipped. Globally, they have flipped in the north. And in the south, they've always been different. I take some heart from that. Thanks very much for having me. And thank you so much for this brilliant panel and for the organizers, Mubanta for Palestine. Thank you for all the co-sponsors um, who came together to make this webinar possible. Um, thank you so much, Peter, Barb. Nasa, Catherine, and Richard, I've been over the past five months thinking about what does it mean to bear witness in this current moment. And bear witnessing means much more to me. We need to take action and we need to do everything we can um, to support the fight of the Palestinians and the fight of Indigenous peoples everywhere. And so in closing, I just want to thank you all. And I thank all of our listeners and whoever's watching online. Um, Thank you. Yours in the fight. Um, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Always will be, always. Always, <laughs> always, always will be. Yes, average <laughs> <to> end. <laughs>